Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for uh, joining the Asian Impact webinar today. So today's webinar is organized to share the most current uh, technology adoption status of uh, key financial market infrastructure in SM plus three region and composed of two sessions. In the first session, I'll make a, a, a quick presentation summarizing the uh, related ADB report uh, recently published. And in the second session, uh, uh, we will learn about uh, technical, I mean, technological innovation in the Asian uh, finance sector and its impact. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's start the webinar with a uh, quick opening remark by Mr. Satoru Yamadera, uh, advisor at ADB. Thomas-san, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, uh, for your kind of participation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Boone and Benedict, uh, for uh, kindly agreeing to join as a panelist. And uh, uh, I really would like to express my sincere appreciation to the uh, cross-border settlement infrastructure uh, members who responded uh, to our uh, survey. Uh, without your cooperation, uh, we couldn't compile this report, interesting report. I really uh, appreciate and uh, hopefully uh, this report give you some sort of sense what's going on currently in ASEAN plus three and uh, I think uh, there are some interesting uh, findings hopefully Andrew can explain so uh, without further ado uh, I'd like to pass the floor back to uh, Andrew thank you uh, thank you thomas -san. yeah uh, now let's start the session one as I mentioned, uh, this presentation uh, will uh, summarize my report published last week uh, titled uh, Recent uh, Technological uh, Advances in the Financial Market Infrastructure in SM Plus 3. So uh, you can follow the link down below to download the report. So uh, this time uh, we will uh, find out about uh, uh, the six key technologies applicable to uh, financial market infrastructure and the most updated adoption status of those technologies by SM plus three uh, central bank and central securities depository, basically. So first of all, uh, to uh, draw some technologies applicable uh, to key financial market infrastructure, I refer to uh, leading global research organizations such as the uh, World Economic Forum, Gartner, and Forrester. So uh, based on the reports from those institutions, I have come up with uh, six technologies as the key uh, enabling technologies with the greatest potential to transform key uh, financial market infrastructure around the world. So uh, those are uh, distributed ledger technology, DLT, artificial intelligence, uh, big data analytics, cloud computing, advanced uh, cybersecurity uh, technologies, and lastly, uh, application programming interfaces, API. So uh, let's find out more uh, about each of those six technologies. So the first one is a DLT blockchain. Uh, distributed ledger uh, can be defined as a shared and synchronized ledger of transaction between parties in a network that is not uh, centrally managed by a central authority. Uh, without a central authority uh, controlling the ledger, uh, copies of the ledger are distributed among all network participants and are continuously and automatically uh, synced. Uh, DLT systems classification in the actual world cannot be dichotomous. Uh, they can be classified according to two dimensions, basically, uh, the network's openness and the functions of its players. It can be either a public or a private DLT system, depending on its openness. And at the same time, it can be a permissioned or permissionless system, depending on the level of permission uh, required to uh, contribute data to uh, the ledger. So DLT uh, initially gained the popularity to uh, lower transaction costs and increase efficiency in financial industry as the early adopters of DLTs were primarily banks and financial uh, institutions. Since then, uh, DLT has sparked uh, uh, interest of stakeholders across a range of industry, industries uh, due to its uh, potential to alter uh, established uh, market dynamics fundamentally. 
Uh, the figure on the lower right hand side shows that uh, cross border uh, uh, payments and settlements were identified as the most prevalent blockchain technology use case, accounting for about 16% uh, of worldwide uh, blockchain technology market in 2021. Uh, from an uh, infrastructure development perspective, uh, DLT can be applied to a financial market infrastructure by redemping existing systems or by uh, constructing end-to-end -end DLT system from scratch. Also, uh, DLT enables any real-world assets such as money, securities, and uh, real estate properties uh, to be uh, issued or represented in a digital tokens without involving a central authority. Uh, this kind of process called asset tokenization can improve asset liquidity uh, by enabling investors to invest a smaller amount of money in a particular asset. Uh, you can uh, find more details on DLT in the report, such as smart contract, consensus mechanism, crypto assets, DLT applications, and central bank digital currencies. So uh, artificial intelligence uh, refers to uh, computational technologies that are inspired by how human uh, thinks and make decisions using their brains and nervous systems, but uh, which typically operate in a different way than humans. AI has begun to surpass humans in several areas, uh, including uh, those requiring cognitive abilities. Uh, you may remember AlphaGo uh, defeated a professional human Go player in 2016. Uh, the contemporary AI technology ecosystem is composed of machine learning, robotics, uh, artificial neural networks, and natural language processing, under uh, each of which there are many uh, subcomponents, as you can see in the figure on the left hand side. Uh, the financial services sector is an ideal candidate for AI uh, since it basically relies on a uh, vast amount of low data. Uh, apart from a uh, basic AI application for uh, uh, process automation, uh, uh, pro, uh, pro detection, uh, cybersecurity, and personalized wealth management are also gaining traction as AI application. As you can see on the uh, graph on the left hand side, I mean on the right hand side. So uh, even though the current AI technologies are based on uh, data driven statistical inference, still have limitations on cognitive reasoning, emotional human like interaction, and the acquisition of numerous abilities. Uh, I think uh, full fledged AI would have the most profound impact on future businesses and human life. I think. Also, uh, this technology uh, could be combined with the other five technology to be explained here, uh, resulting in upgrading their functionalities and capabilities. For example, uh, AI has the potential to integrate with a smart contract on a DLT system. If the AI thoroughly uh, understands the DLT's rules and policies, it would enable uh, the formulation, execution of highly sophisticated uh, smart contract. Yeah, uh, uh, big data analytics is the process of identifying trends, patterns, and correlation in massive amount of low data in order to uh, aid in uh, uh, making uh, data informed uh, decisions. Uh, these procedures employ uh, well known statistical analytic techniques or other tools to larger data sets. They comprise a structured, semi-structured, and unstructured data from uh, various sources and sizes. Uh, big data also has the potential to have huge impact on enterprises across multiple uh, industry sectors. Uh, for example, uh, financial analytics help financial industry improve customer targeting, uh, make more informed decisions, and may, uh, manage claims more effectively while limiting risk and fraud. Uh, the figure on the right hand side shows that the leading industries uh, based on their uh, share of the global uh, big data analytics market in 2019. Uh, that year, uh, banking uh, was responsible for producing 13.9% of big data analytics revenue. So uh, next technology is cloud computing. 
uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology uh, defines uh, cloud computing as a model for enabling a ubiquitous, a convenient on-demand network access to a shared pool of configurable computing resources, such as uh, servers, storage, and applications. They can be uh, rapidly provisioned and uh, released with a minimal uh, uh, management effort or service provider interactions. Uh, this cloud computing is composed of three service models and four deployment models. Uh, the three service delivery models are infrastructure as a service, uh, platform as a service, and software as a service. Uh, the figure on the upper left hand Side shows that uh, by 2020, global spending on public cloud services reached roughly 312 billion USD, and spending for software as a service uh, comprised the largest portion. Uh, in terms of the de uh, deployment aspect, uh, there are four types of cloud services public, private, community, and hybrid cloud. A hybrid cloud combines two or more cloud types, public, private, or community clouds from one or more uh, service providers. Uh, the figure on the lower left uh, shows that uh, the share of public cloud service has been growing uh, steadily since 2014 and is expected to reach almost 46% by uh, 2024. Uh, while many uh, businesses recognize the benefit of cloud computing, uh, they are still uh, concerned about its security. The figure on the upper uh, right uh, illustrates the growth rate of various IT security segments uh, worldwide in 2021, uh, in which uh, cloud security spending is predicted as the most rapidly growing segment in the IT security market in 2021. Uh, that's uh, largely uh, because of increased uh, demand for cloud solution because of the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, resulting increase in work from home uh, arrangements. Uh, along with a cyber, I mean, uh, cloud security, uh, uh, multi-cloud and uh, hybrid clouds are likely to grow in popularity as a result of uh, COVID-19 as well. So cybersecurity technologies. Uh, cybersecurity, often uh, referred to as IT security, is the discipline of defending uh, key systems and sensitive data against uh, digital intrusions. Uh, the most uh, confounding aspect of cybersecurity is the uh, ever-changing nature of security concerns. IT security is becoming more critical as our reliance on computer systems, the internet and mobile and smart devices continues to grow. And as a tech technologies combined with AI and machine learning often exceed uh, different technologies. There is a wide variety of cybersecurity threats, uh, malware, including frozen and ransomware, uh, social engineering, including phishing, and DDoS attacks, et cetera. A figure on the upper left shows that IT security professional chose malware as the most concerning cyber threat in 2020, and phishing and ransomware were tied for a second. Uh, uh, when it comes to cybersecurity practices and technologies, uh, there are various techniques, including identity and access management, IAM, behavioral monitoring, mobile device management, endpoint detection and responses, and intrusion detection system ideas, et cetera. Uh, the figure on the upper right uh, shows a 2020 survey result uh, stating uh, the most widely used uh, security automation uh, tools. Uh, another uh, 2020 uh, global survey shown on the lower right uh, stated that uh, the consumption of a security as a service, a secure cloud migration, and the implementation of a zero trust architecture, among other things, are uh, their organization's post-pandemic cybersecurity uh, priorities. Yeah, application programming interface. Uh, an API uh, is a collection of instructions that uh, define how one application communicates and interacts with another. Uh, in contrast to a, a user interface, which links a computer to a human, 
An API connects computers or other uh, software applications to another uh, computers or software applications. Uh, the reason uh, the APIs are important in digital transformation is that uh, the, they enable uh, diverse business service business services and resources to be uh, released from silos and make interoperable and reusable in various contexts, including uh, through the combination of its internal assets with the assets of external counterparties. API application scenarios can be limitless, but uh, some important areas include uh, the use of software as a service, hybrid cloud adoption, and open banking or embedded finance in finance sector. Uh, now, uh, let's find out about the current uh, technology adoption status of SM plus three FMIs. Uh, this uh, new uh, technology stock taking in the city is based on a 2021 survey of Central Securities Depository and Central Bank in the SM plus three region uh, that are the members of CSIF. Uh, CSIF, uh, Cross-Border Settlement Infrastructure Forum, whose members are Central Bank and CSIS in SM plus three, is a sub-forum of Asian bond market initiatives and established to uh, support the advancement of member market infrastructures and support the, uh, the development of a regional uh, settlement intermediary, uh, RSI in SM plus three. So, uh, uh, Overall, uh, 20 of the uh, 25 CSI member institutions responded to the survey. And if you see the left hand side graph, uh, of the respondents, uh, 16 of the 20 institutions stated that uh, they have explored at least one of the six selected new technologies. Uh, five members have explored a single new technology, three have explored two, uh, six have explored three, and to have explored four. Uh, in terms of the number of the CSI member working with the new technologies as shown in the right hand side graph, six out of 20 institutions that applied to the survey indicated that uh, they have engaged in or uh, currently involved in a DLT. Three members in artificial intelligence, five members in big data analytics, uh, two members in cloud computing, eight members in cybersecurity technologies, and 10 members in APIs. Uh, among the six new technologies, uh, the top three uh, new technology, technologies that uh, members are uh, trying to apply actively are DLT, uh, cybersecurity technology, and APIs. Uh, the result also uh, shows that uh, central bank and CSE in SM plus three uh, tends to be uh, less interested in AI and cloud computing technologies, uh, most likely uh, due to uh, concerns about AI's uh, technological immaturity and cloud computing's uh, security. Yeah, uh, basically uh, the survey discovered a total of 38 application cases for the uh, six technologies among CSI members, uh, 22 cases from Central Bank and 16 from CSEs. API application cases accounted for about uh, 26 of all cases, followed by uh, DLT and cybersecurity, each of which accounted for uh, 21%. Uh, all eight uh, cybersecurity application cases were at the production level, in comparison, uh, the other technologies had uh, multiple levels of uh, applications. For example, uh, the eight uh, DLT cases included uh, two POCs, one prototype, two pilots, and three productions. Uh, the survey uh, identified uh, several texts that uh, there are uh, production cases for all six technologies. Uh, CSI members are exploring DLT at all application levels. And there are three uh, production level uh, DLT based system in SM plus three key financial market infrastructures. 
Uh, before I explain the diagram on the right, uh, uh, let me uh, quickly explain the concept of IT system application level for your easy understanding. Uh, a proof of concept POC is a small activity designed to evaluate the real world of viability of a vague concept or idea. Uh, this is not about uh, delivering the idea, but about uh, showing its feasibility. A prototype is the visible and practical embodiment of an idea that uh, simulates the entire system or a significant portion. While a POC demonstrates uh, whether a concept or idea can be implemented, uh, a prototype illustrates how it will be implemented. A pilot is a productized version of a system offered to a subset of the entire audience. Uh, a pilot study aims to uh, understand how the product will be served in the actual domain and optimize it. Uh, production, of course, means implementing and integrating an entire system into the whole day-to-day -day running business systems. So uh, the diagram on the right uh, shows the number of new technology applied FMI systems by application level. Uh, production cases accounted for 24 of the 38 total cases, or 63%, given that uh, the majority of application cases involving uh, cybersecurity and APIs were at the production level. Uh, this diagram summarizes the survey results explained so far. Uh, with this figure, you can tell immediately uh, which institution employs uh, which technology at what level. Uh, green is central bank and dark pink red is a central security depository. So uh, for example, on the row right hand uh, quadrant, uh, TSC, Thailand CSC, uh, SCX, SCX and Stock Exchange of Singapore, and MBC, Central Bank of Cambodia, has a production level uh, DLT system uh, respectively. And on the upper left quadrant, uh, HKMA, uh, for example, Central Bank of Hong Kong, China, and KSD, uh, CSD of, uh, of South Korea, uh, run the POC on DLT uh, respectively. Yeah, uh, uh, the following uh, six slides explain each and every application case by technology obtained from the survey. Uh, you can find the names of system developed, uh, their application levels, uh, development periods, and other details. Uh, for your information, a uh, total of uh, 38 cases were reported through the survey, uh, but I believe uh, there would be more cases for sure uh, because I couldn't uh, get the uh, survey response from five CSI member institution, and also uh, some of the responded members uh, left some cases out for some reasons. Uh, in the case of DLT, uh, I found uh, at least 10 central bank in the SM Plus region are studying uh, central bank digital currency CBDCs on DLT as of uh, January 2022. Uh, the total number of cases were 15, and 12 of those 15 cases were POC or pilots, but only one case were reported through the survey. Also, uh, in the case of cybersecurity, I identified eight production cases from the survey, but uh, there would be more because uh, some members declined to disclose the information for security reasons. And I also presume uh, some members intentionally have also not provided that information for a security reason as well. Uh, uh, let me uh, wrap up my presentation uh, explaining uh, new technologies, uh, new technologies applicability to uh, RSI model under CSIS. Uh, CSD Altijas Linkages is a conceptual RSI model and designed through CSI discussion to promote a safe and efficient uh, intra-regional cross-border financial transaction by directly linking uh, settlement systems of central bank and CSD in the region. So basically, uh, all six technologies also uh, can be deployed to the uh, this uh, link model, albeit at different moments in time. Uh, in the short term, I believe uh, DLT combined with APIs and cloud computing can be a viable target for application. Uh, adopting a technically, uh, technically uh, feasible, uh, scalable, and decentralized governance structure enabled by DLT 
could alleviate participating member markets from the geopolitical hegemony dilemma inherent in centralized regional market infrastructure. Also, uh, cloud computing, APIs, and cybersecurity technologies would be all required to ensure the linked systems of ubiquity, interoperability, and security. Uh, from a longer perspective, the remaining two uh, technology, AI and uh, big data analytics, can be implemented as needed. And uh, currently, uh, ADB, acting as the CSF Secretariat, is engaged in an experimental project uh, exploring the redesign of CSDL TGS linked model using DLT. Uh, this to be created a DLT based links model is envisioned to serve as a baseline for uh, CSI members' future development of DLT based market infrastructure. Uh, this project outcome will be uh, released in separate uh, report around the end of this year. So uh, let me pause here and thank you for listening. Uh, now uh, let's move on to the session two and learn how technical innovation is shaping the agent. Uh, finance sector uh, through the panel uh, discussion. So uh, Ms. Uh, Pinhuan PBU at ADB will uh, moderate the sessions and Mr. Bun Hong Chen, uh, head of fund services and security market and uh, technology uh, at, at Deutsche Bank. And Ms. Benedict uh, Nolens, head of uh, BIS Innovation Hub Hong Kong Center. And Mr. Satoru Yamadera, uh, advisor at ADB will join as a panelist. Uh, over to you, PV. Okay, thank you, Andrew, for your excellent presentation and, and the introduction of the panelists. And thank you, our audience, for your participation. Uh, before we proceed to the panel discussion, let me remind our audience, again, please type your questions in the Q&A box. You can also like or thumbs up to the existing questions. Um, so we will cover your question or the most popular questions as much as we can within the time. So now let me kick off this panel discussion with the first question. And I would like to start from thomas the advisor of the ADB. Uh, so thomas in Andrew's presentation, it has outlined many important issues on how new technologies can contribute to the region's market infrastructure system. What is your view of the survey on the recent technological advances in the financial market infrastructure in ASEAN plus three? And what is your observation of the growth paths in the financial market in terms of these emerging technologies? Over to you, Thomas. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Phoebe. And uh, well, Andrew, uh, thank you so much for your excellent presentation. Also, uh, again, I'd like to thank CSIF members uh, for providing us and answering those uh, survey questions. Uh, as Andrew explained, uh, I think uh, the first important finding is uh, all central banks and the CSDs in this region, uh, they really need to consider those emerging technologies. Uh, regardless, only they focus on one part or many. Uh, this is really the fact. And the more importantly, uh, I realize uh, many of our CSIF members uh, already uh, sort of uh, uh, conducting a POC or already in the production. And uh, that is also important. And I would say that there is a kind of uh, uh, sort of about, uh, they really feel some sort of uh, external pressure to uh, some extent uh, because private sector really uh, need to transform. So the central banks and CSDs uh, although they are critical market infrastructure and they cannot uh, sort of a fail to make a transaction, but they also need to keep up with uh, those technological changes. And I think uh, this report clearly uh, shows that the uh, central, uh, the consideration of central banks and CSDs, and uh, uh, they are uh, ready to uh, make uh, changes. Uh, I think that's quite the important finding. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Thomas, for your for your comment. So next, I would like to invite Ms. Benedict Nolans for the next question. So Benedict, you are the head of the BIS Innovation Hub of Hong Kong Center. 
So as the BIS Innovation Hub aims to foster the innovation and knowledge sharing that is relevant for central banks, could you firstly illustrate the major things that the BIS Innovation Hub is working on? Then um, how is the hub trying to support the central banks in promoting the groundbreaking innovations that would make the impact on the financial system? And what challenges have you encountered? Over to you, Benedict. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the very interesting uh, presentation, Andrew. <clears throat> Maybe uh, to, to link it actually to what Andrew has been presenting, because a lot of what he has said is, is completely relevant to what we are doing at the BIS Innovation Hub. So as a starter, the BIS is the central bank for the central banks. Uh, it mostly manages the money of, of central banks, and it also issues a lot of thought leadership uh, research, including on topics such as fintech, crypto, uh, etc. Our Bitcoin reports are not always loved, <laughs> by the Bitcoin community at least. <laughs> so, um, and, and about two years ago, the, the most recent addition, you could say, to the BIS family has been this uh, BIS Innovation Hub. And we now have seven centers across the world. So we have one in Hong Kong, which is the one I'm heading. We have one in Singapore. We have one in Switzerland. Uh, and we've recently opened one in the, in the Eurozone, also one in Stockholm, one coming in Toronto, and uh, BOE already open as well. Uh, and we have uh, also a partnership with the Fed. So the whole idea of this BIS Innovation Hub and its centers is really to work with uh, central banks, typically around us, but it doesn't need to be around us. I'll give you an illustration later uh, on topics uh, of the type that Andrew is actually presented to you. So um, Andrew presented that uh, DLT was, for example, one of the leading uh, trends and I would say it's definitely also a trend within the BIS uh, Innovation Hub. So while I can't cover all our projects globally because we have quite a lot of them, uh, and you can access them on our website by simply going to BIS Innovation Hub and then clicking on teams, which are our, our six core teams, uh, including CBDC, FMI, cyber, green finance, open finance, uh, and I'm missing one of them. Um, you can click on the dials there and, and you can see the, the fully announced projects, which are typically fully in flight projects by clicking on the dials under so BIS Innovation Hub Teams. Uh, so um, for, for my center, the Hong Kong Center, uh, in, in the area of DLT, uh, we've actually three projects in that space. So one project has been a green finance project where we've investigated the placement of government bonds to retail investors. And in this case, green bonds linked also with um, IoT based reporting of, of, of the, green, the green outcomes of, of the bond investment. To put that very simply, that means uh, for, let's say, hypothetical case, of having uh, solar panels, you connect the solar panels to IoT devices that can report back how much renewable energy is being generated. So this prototype integrated both the tokenization of the bond itself with that reporting uh, approach. Uh, it was a showcase uh, project uh, pretty much to show that the capabilities of technology are already there and can be integrated. Uh, but it was, as described by Andrew, indeed a prototype as opposed to a live system. So we have uh, an extension project going on to, to Genesis, which will also look at uh, bond tokenization, but attaching the future mitigation outcomes recognized under the national uh, processes under the Paris Agreement. So in some, if a country says, I will reduce my emissions by Y, there is a process within the country to recognize projects as having, um, as being able to qualify for contributing to that target. And so 
that's called mitigation outcomes. And, and in this bond example, we would attach these mitigation outcomes in the form of either a security, for now we've called it mitigation outcome interest, to the bond. So for the bond buyers, the interest, the interesting aspect should be that aside from coupon, you actually have future exposure to mitigation outcomes, which you could equate to carbon credits, but compliance carbon credits as opposed to voluntary carbon credits. So a third project we have uh, in DLT is, is the Enbridge. Um, it is a it is a payment infrastructure that we're investigating and currently working across four countries, which is uh, the People's Bank of China, the HKMA, the Bank of Thailand, and the CBUAE. And so the the goal there is to to let's say we did a POC under to your definition of of POC uh, in in Tanam Lion Rock, which was already more than two years ago, and the POC showed that the use of DLT definitely can speed up these payments and reduce the steps in a correspondent banking system. Uh, but to to comment on on your your request in terms of the challenges, the challenges is to actually get the POC to a life system. So as you as you walk through that path, uh, you encounter indeed prototype, then you encounter pilot, and then you encounter life system. So um, we we already did uh, a second prototype, actually a third prototype. So. At this stage, it is a very advanced prototype, but that prototype now needs to be piloted. And then ultimately there still needs to be a decision as to, as to uh, robustness for life, uh, life launch. And then one more project we're doing on DLT is in retail CBDC. So we're there investigating whether a DLT across different banks can actually help the system or slow down the system. And so we'll be issuing our research on that in the next uh, few months. Um, and <clears throat> all the other technologies <clears throat> mentioned by Andrew are each uh, equally important, I'd say, but I think I want to pass it now back to my panel members and, and we can discuss some of the others later. Thank you very much, Benedict, for articulating the important role of BI's innovation hub on spearheading central banks' responses to digital innovation. So next, I want to lay the question to Mr. Bu, Bu Hyung Chang. So Bu, you are the head of the securities market and technology advocacy in Deutsche Bank. With your ex extensive experience in technology experiments, I would appreciate to have your perspective about what should the central banks and central securities depository pay attention to regarding the technological development of the private sector. And also as the financial authorities are exploring various uh, technologies at different application level, what is your take on their pace to adjusting to the digital transformation? Over to you, Boom. Thank you very much, uh, Phoebe. Uh, and you know, good morning and good day to everybody here. My name is Boon. I'm from Deutsche Bank. Uh, firstly, uh, we would like to uh, say our appreciation and thanks to uh, CSI, CSFI, ADB, and ABMF, and to Andrew uh, and Domo as well uh, for this opportunity to contribute uh, our views and to join this uh, uh, panel. Um, we find that you know the report that uh, Andrew has uh, authored and uh, introduced just now uh, is very pertinent and it covers right, all the very important areas um, that the uh, financial uh, industry uh, is actually grappling. So you know, let me uh, firstly uh, start with uh, the first question from uh, Phoebe. So I think there are two questions. Right? So first question is, you know, uh, what should central banks and CSC pay attention to the technology development in the private sector? Uh, firstly, uh, to paint an, um, uh, our uh, journey, uh, I think all of us uh, should recognize that we are actually in a transition period uh, between right, established traditional methods of how we are doing things. For example, right, you know, uh, we are still bearing the legacy of sequential processes uh, from the uh, 1970s uh, Wall Street paper uh, crisis, and you know, and the and the clearing and settlement practices CCP CSDs, right? You know, are actually uh, coming from the G30 group um, recommendations, right, in 2003 
on security, uh, clearing, and settlement. So, you know, we're moving away from those uh, established uh, paradigm and evolving right to the more uh, digital ways. So I think, you know, this uh, could form uh, as a nexus, right, to the uh, really good survey results that uh, Andrew Jessen has uh, showed us. So let me just quickly highlight uh, two points. First, the uh, data, and secondly, on this uh, digital uh, assets. The data, um, you know, from a private sector basis, we have seen the uh, data to be uh, used by, for example, uh, social media, right sharing, you know, uh, online content like Netflix. What they actually really showed was, you know, uh, digital data, real-time streaming, high-speed data, and complete data. Uh, packed together with AI and, and analytics to create new stuffs. In our um, industry, we have actually seen, and you know, Deutsche has uh, piloted in Europe, right, a predictive settlement based on real uh, time post trade uh, data in order to uh, do circum uh, in order to predict uh, what are the probability of a trade failing uh, in uh, you know uh, in Europe, and therefore, right, you know, to quickly alert uh, operators and uh, operations. Uh, to uh, pay attention to those uh, possibility. So from uh, Asia and uh, you know uh, across the um, uh, ASEAN plus three um, markets, right? Uh, one of the thing um, is really to uh, to pay attention to is you know the availability of real time data from the CSD, um, you know which actually uh, could provide right new growth um, uh, areas for the industry from analytics, uh, you know using uh, AI. So you can see employment, you can see new expertise there, and then you know leading to higher level of uh, market integrity. And this is really important for CSD uh, to have, right? You know, um, open ports, real time uh, data, and the use of API. That again, the report has uh, shown. So you know, this on data and um, and analytics um, that you know we see uh, that could go forward uh, more. The second one is actually really on uh, digital uh, assets. And in this case, right, you know, uh, uh, we, we, we take inspiration uh, from a speech by the French central banker, uh, central bank governor, right, when he talked about the triple revolution, digital asset together with changes in roles and the new players and the infrastructure changes as well. For example, decentralization, programmability, using smart contract, disintermediation or re-intermediation using a DeFi. And then we look at DeFi, right, uh, you know, not exactly as disintermediation, but right, the use of agency model in place of a principal model in order for banking activities uh, to be conducted. So, you know, um, there's actually a lot of uh, examples uh, in, in the uh, private sector that um, I believe uh, CSDs and uh, central banks are already drawing. Uh, so just to add to the list of uh, really groundbreaking uh, uh, experiments uh, that you know the BIS uh, is doing. Uh, it actually includes, for example, in Switzerland, uh, with the Swiss uh, Central Bank uh, and the CSD and commercial banks there on seeing how central bank digital currency can be handled to settle tokenized assets and CBDCs. So you know uh, that's actually a really uh, interesting uh, study project, uh, Helvetia. In uh, Thailand, uh, you know, um, Thailand BOT, Bank of Thailand and Ministry of uh, Finance have actually used a DLT in a very compact in intermediary light way to distribute, right? You know, they are one baht digital bond for financial inclusion. And, you know, uh, this has been really successfully uh, launched and there's two live tranches, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And, you know, earlier this year, um, there's uh, even a private sector um, using uh, this uh, digital uh, bond format uh, to also directly reach out from issuer to investor, uh, um, uh, you know, a, 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 sorry, from an issuer to investor uh, uh, model. So to conclude on this uh, question, I'll say that, you know, from a CSE perspective, um, the role is changing. You are actually a center of gravity for all market infrastructure uh, participants and in fact the whole market uh, infrastructure we can see that you know if you change a settlement cycle it affects everybody uh, likewise if you actually adopt right you know real-time uh, data uh, dlt concurrent processing it could actually evolve the market to realize new growth possibilities and at the same time to uh, take out some of this cost that has been building right you know since uh, traditional time from a central bank, uh, we can see that, you know, in addition to their regulatory uh, role, uh, you know, personified by BIS, right, you know, they are also an innovator. 
right? You know, so you know between the two, uh, they are actually driving a, a lot of uh, changes here. So just taking, for example, in the CBDC space, right? It's not just about efficiency, uh, and you know they are conducting a lot of uh, different models. But at the same time as well, there is an opportunity there to say, hey, can we actually include right documentary or information payload to CBDC so that you know CBDC right can actually start. Uh, addressing as well, right? You know, FX control monitoring requirements, AML requirements, quota monitoring requirements that this region actually faces uh, every day, so that efficient payment can be accompanied by efficient information payload as well. Um, Phoebe, I think I will stop here because you know uh, there's actually a lot of things that's happening in this space that uh, all of us uh, have uh, have got lots um, to uh, to share and to uh, discuss. So shall I take your second question as part of Q&A? Okay. Thank you, Boo. Thank you very Thank much you. for your comments. Uh, that's a, a lot of important issue to discuss. And so now I see there's uh, some questions popped up in the QA box. So uh, maybe let me select the first uh, most uh, popular questions from Edgar. So the question is, um, with the investment of IT security infrastructure, what technological uh, advances we're looking for in the next uh, 10 to 20 years that we expect to see cooperations with the group of nations? Do we have the detailed platforms and access the ADB countries to apply the technologies we are looking on central banks, international and local financial institutions as well? Thanks, uh, thanks Edgar. So maybe I would like to ask uh, Thomason to answer this question. Over to you, Thomason. Okay, uh, thanks, baby. Uh, Edgar, uh, thank you for very difficult question to answer. Uh, particularly the area of cybersecurity, uh, I have to say uh, there's no panacea. There's no single bullet, uh, sort of a silver bullet solution uh, to overcome. Uh, as you may understand this area of cybersecurity, of course, we may be able to block uh, intrusion uh, by sort of by creating separate network and so forth. Uh, but more and more uh, sort of attackers are looking at the, the individuals accessing to the system. So so-called social engineering is really becoming the risk. Uh, so uh, so the uh, um, um, attackers somehow uh, identify the person who is accessing the network and then try to mimic or whatever the way trick the uh, the uh, people accessing the network and try to sneak into the system. Unfortunately, uh, there is no uh, easiest uh, easy solution. Uh, so simply we need to create more awareness, understanding. And also, uh, maybe uh, there may be some area uh, which uh, we can analyze the people's behavior, then uh, we may be able to block those sort of uh, intrusion. Uh, but again, uh, this is not easy. Uh, and um, uh, I guess uh, central banks and CSTs particularly, since we are the critical market infrastructure, uh, we need to make more investment on those. Yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Thomason. Uh, so now let me to ask the other panelists about the questions about disrupt disruptive technologies. So, um, okay, so um, I would like to ask each panelist for your perspective on the emerging te technologies, as we have touched upon a lot of issues today, including the six new technologies, uh, including DLT blockchain, big data analytics, cloud, uh, cloud computing, open API, and cybersecurity that are used by the region's systematically important financial market infrastructure. With uh, technologies, uh, so which, in your view, which technologies, in your view, have the greatest potential to disrupt the financial market landscape? And do you see the positive or negative net effect on the financial stability? And also, what tools and approaches could be considered to mitigate the, any adverse impact of these technologies on the financial market infrastructure? So uh, maybe we could uh, start from Thomas, please, to have your perspective. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Phoebe. 
Well, um, I think, um, I mean, in my view, uh, it is a bit risky to pick, let's say, one of six uh, new technologies. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, things are changing rapidly, and uh, we may see uh, new technologies, seven or eight new technologies. Uh, so we need to really pay attention to the, all the developments. Um, but I think uh, one of the questions coming from the audience, uh, you know, there's a, just sort of the gap. Uh, so that some countries may be able to follow those new uh, emergence of technologies, uh, but not all. That's really the fact. And that's why ADB uh, is conducting uh, the research. And we try to provide the, the information, understanding. Uh, currently, uh, we are conducting the PLC how we can utilize DOT blockchain for CSDs and the central banks linkages uh, for cross-border. Hopefully, uh, we can share those uh, understanding in the knowledge and experience and uh, expertise uh, to our member countries. So equally, our member countries can develop and have a benefit of accessing new technologies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tomosa, for your comments. Uh, so, Benedict, may I have your perspective, please? Thank you. Yes, so to go back to the uh, list that Andrew had, so um, he mentioned cloud, cyber, and APIs. In my opinion, they're nearly, um, let's say, I don't consider them disruptive. I consider them facilitative to, to some of the disruptive ones. So in some, a lot of what we uh, build has to use cloud. It obviously has to be cyber secure, and that's a really big challenge. Uh, and, and a number of these things will be using APIs for connectivity um, reasons. So in terms of the question, therefore, specifically on, on which ones are disrupt disruptive, I think um, DLT remains potentially disruptive. Uh, but obviously, uh, some of the wobblings we've seen over the last few weeks, and it being the third time, not just the first time, but the third time that you see such material drops in these, um, you know, markets, in these crypto markets, uh, it, it will maybe take some of the disruptive nature out of DLT, I, I would guess. Um, but it doesn't take away that DLT uh, still may be completely needed to replace standing infrastructures to the point that Tomo was making, right? So, but disruptive is, in my view, when it replaces a standing industry, it completely disrupts that, like the, the Xerox case, right? Or the Kodak case. So, I, I think the more mistakes, frankly, the decentralized sector makes, the more it makes it very hard to be completely dis disruptive. Uh, but that said, I mean, it's not off the table that people would be massively adopting these things, but um, when it drops by 60%, it is less likely than it is when it goes up by 300%. <laughs> okay. DeFi within that, I think, is, is disruptive. Um, and I think uh, AI combined with IoT can be uh, disruptive or facilitative, right? So it can be used to augment a lot of our activities as well. So, so that would be uh, my answer. Thank you very much, Benedict, for your comments. So uh, next, uh, we'd like to ask Boone for your thoughts on this, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Phoebe. Um, so it, just to add, right, you know, uh, disruption actually comes uh, not exactly from the technology per se, but actually how the technology is uh, deployed. So for example, in the operating model, so DLT and uh, tokenized assets, uh, digital bonds, right, you know, we've spoken about the direct issue to investor model, which removes uh, a number of uh, intermediaries and make use of uh, blockchain uh, capabilities, right, in place of those uh, intermediaries. This actually shrinks um, the uh, footprint um, and actually makes it more uh, cost-effective and you know uh, faster to read for issuers to, to issue. 
All right, so you know um, that's one example of you know a potentially disruptive uh, operating model. The other one, of course, is you know on the fractionalization and tokenization, which is uh, lending itself to you know financial inclusion across the whole country. As long as you've got a mobile phone, as long as you are subscribed right and downloaded the uh, right uh, application, you are able to participate in the financial inclusion and financial welfare initiatives. It no longer depends on you know um, where you are or you know how accessible you are. It is accessible because, right, you know, of the technology. So, so this is another way of uh, disruption. And then uh, finally, right, you know, um, uh, well, I won't say finally, but, you know, uh, a number of other things. Let me just give uh, another two example. Uh, from a permission uh, at DeFi perspective, DeFi, right, you know, is really looking at how do, you know, you use a smart contract as an agency in place of principle in order to perform uh, banking activities like, you know, borrowing, lending, uh, market making. And we all know that, you know, in the traditional space, market making has is actually expensive, uh, especially if, you know, you need to hold inventory and, you know, you are taking on a risk. And if you do not know, especially for a new product, right, you know, the uh, risk profile then becomes even more difficult. So the DeFi space is actually showing, right, how an alternative uh, method could be done. It's in its early days. And, you know, the disruption or the crisis there today uh, is, you know, as a result of um, breaching the upper boundary of utility and finding a new relationship after the upper boundary that we have also uh, seen in the traditional world as well, from, you know, uh, long-term capital uh, management to MADOP to, um, to Lehman. So where we, are, where we can actually uh, learn that the disruption, the potential disruption is how do you actually then apply the DeFi concept, right, to a permission DeFi so that, you know, things can be made uh, safer, better, better governed as well and more accountable um, in order to facilitate, for example, um, the launches of new products and their trading um, that, you know, doesn't then really depend on the number of uh, market makers uh, to step in to say, oh, you know, um, yeah, maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't, uh, which then can affect the success of uh, new uh, digital products. One of the other disruption, and uh, you know, uh, I like to mention is actually the perception, touching on cybersecurity. Cybersecurity has always been seen as, you know, sort of a back office to keep things safe as a uh, cyber hygiene, but it's no longer really that true. Because right, you know, without cybersecurity, you can't have digital um, asset custody. So you know, cybersecurity is now right, has an additional value uh, in the front office space, so to speak, right? In ensuring that you know um, that asset protection and investor protection are able to be enforced, because there is this uh, cybersecurity, although right, you know, is done uh, differently. So there is a different perception and different angles now to cybersecurity, one for the organization and the other for the product. So uh, I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you very much, Wu. Uh, so we are now reaching the end of our panel discussion. Um, I want to wrap up the discussion and maybe we could ask Tomo San again to give the last word to our audience. Um, so where do you see the biggest impact for driving and improving new technologies in the financial sector in the next few years. Thank you, mm -hmm. thank you, Tomasa. Yeah, thanks. Uh, well, um, I think uh, the, the technologies that we both highlights uh, definitely uh, creates the impact. Uh, for uh, market infrastructures like central banks and CSDs, I understand the hesitance of uh, using cloud computing uh, due to the uh, data localization, or some sort of a security concern. Um, but uh, for the private sector, uh, definitely, uh, we need to support implementation of those uh, cloud computing technologies because maybe uh, it's better uh, in terms of cybersecurity, uh, those cloud computing service provider may be able to provide more resources. Likewise, uh, we need to really think how those new technology uh, can be implementable uh, uh, in existing, in some sense, legacy system. So it is important that we keep tracking those changes and hopefully uh, we can see and share uh, those sort of information through our uh, cross-border settlement infrastructure forum, as well as ASEAN plus three uh, bond market forum, uh, which is really the, the venue 
to bring the private and public sector experts together uh, as Boone is our regular uh, participants. Uh, so we hope to continue uh, those discussions. And uh, uh, again, as I said, ADB uh, will be uh, as a knowledge hub like BIS to share our findings and also the knowledge and expertise. So if you have any further request, uh, we are happy to accommodate. And uh, uh, from time to time, I uh, very much hope that the, uh, we can work with the uh, together the BIS Technology Hub, Innovation Hub, so uh, we can share all the uh, information with our uh, colleagues and central banks in this region. And that's all from me. Thanks. Thank you, Tomasa. Thank you very much. So um, I want to thank all the panelists very much today for your time and your insights. And also uh, thank you our audience for your active participation. Uh, that is a very fruitful discussion and I hope you'll find it very interesting. So the next uh, Asian Impact webinar entitled Recovering Learning Losses from the COVID-19 Pandemic with our Chief Economist Albert Park is coming soon in July. And this will also be held virtually via Zoom. More details on this event will be available soon in the Asia Impact webinar website and in the ADB Chief Economist Twitter account that is to post on the right hand side. So thank you very much for joining us and I hope you have a good day. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>